taking off, you know, it's like starting struggling with your alphabet and then you string a few words together, you get some sentences and then taking off for more confident readers, you know. And then it's like that with, with everything we, we do in life, you know, we begin by not knowing and then then we learn and we learn a few things. We learn from others who, who can teach us and we put a few things together and, and uh, gradually we gain confidence. As, as we explore new new territories, and uh, I know I, for myself, I'm the youngest of four children, so I was, you know, everybody always knew things that I didn't know yet. It's like there's this whole world out there that I'm supposed to know that I don't know, and so there was this sense of like um, the world and life being some some uh, unknown to to move into, and. Uh, I recognised, reflecting on going into the monastery, uh, which was, was not for me a, a, a hiding from life, but more of a wish to, to really confront uh, truth. Um, uh, there was a really deep wish to, to find a place of safety. I think that was a, a big motivation of looking for a place of safety. And um, you know, I think a, a monastery is, is pretty good as far as that goes in many ways, but like any, anything in the world, it's, it can't be 100% safe. Nothing can be. Just just having been born and, and being in, in a vulnerable body means we can't be 100% safe. But just recognizing that kind of yearning of the heart to be to have safety. And um, there's a, um, a sutta, they're called the Mangala Sutta, where the, the Buddha speaks about the highest blessings. And he, he kind of guides, it's, it's a way of speaking about the Eightfold Path but in a very um, practical way about how you know who you who your friends are and, and where you where you live and what your livelihood is and what you put your energy into and uh, you know, practice and gaining insight and uh, the very last phrase of that sutta is and every place for them is safe. So it's like when you follow this path, you come to a place where. Wherever you go, there's safety. Every place for them is safe. This, these are the highest blessings. I always found that such a beautiful um, potential. You know, I'd hear that line of like, "I want that. I want that." You know, I want to find that place of safety. And uh, in a way, in order to to find it, it does take a lot of courage. It's like we have to keep turning towards what is. And uh, at first, it seems like it's uh, it's you know, situations that life life presents us, situations or, or, or people that we have to we have to confront, we have to rise up to, we have to have uh, the courage to meet. And um, but what I found as, as time goes by and as my practice deepens, that what it kind of comes down to is having the courage to feel. It's as simple as that. Having the courage to simply feel what's what it feels like right now, you know. <laughs> so um, I'm not, uh, you know, I've never been a, a mountain climber or gone for, you know, sort of dangerous sports or anything like that. But it, there have been times in my life where I've had to make big leaps and uh, step into very unknown situations where it's felt quite vulnerable, and uh, and and been like that for kind of quite a long time. Of like not sure, not sure, not sure, not sure. You know. It's, that the expression, I don't know if you have it over here, but in, over in America they have this expression, leap and the net will appear. Mm. It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> that feeling of like, okay, I've leapt now, where's the net? Where's the net? You know? so, um, so it takes a certain courage just to, to keep going in life without, without hiding, you know, without staying within the, the comfort zone. And if we do stay within the comfort zone, it does become uncomfortable. It does become profoundly uncomfortable after a while. So you kind of have to keep moving on. Um, but anyway, just realizing in, in all of those situations, there's this sense of, well, what's, what's, uh, you know, what is it that has to be confronted? Where, where is it that the courage is needed? And it can be a, a courage to make a step and you know, to, to keep going in the direction you, need, you know you need to go. But really, when it really comes down to it, it's just the courage to feel what is going on right now. And uh, for myself, going moving to America, it was, it was a huge uh, learning curve. 
for me. I lived in, I'd lived in a community for a long time in England, and one of many, many people, and then suddenly kind of dying in a, over in a foreign country where everything looks the same, but it, it, it's like 180 degrees different. And um, having to teach, which I wasn't used to doing, to large numbers of people, and uh, having to learn how to run a monastery, which I didn't know how to do, it's just got all this coming. And um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of stress and a lot of uh, sense of not knowing. And, and, and we live on faith, so it's not like there's a big bank account that was, is going with us. It's like, you know, there, there were a few women over in America who had, had a, a bit of money between them and not a lot. And, and just sort of like, okay, let's see what happens. It was a bit like that. And, and uh, as it turned out, the, the bridge, you know, people say, don't burn your bridges. And, and the bridge that I had to get across to get there was already burning as I was crossing. So it's like, okay, there's no going back. And, and um, and this sense of like, okay, this life has has pushed me into this situation, and it takes a certain courage. And I, I must admit, there were there were days when I would wake up in the morning and feel like, no, I, I can't, I can't, I can't do it, I can't do it today. But then it's like, well, there's no choice actually. The day has, the sun has risen, the day is here, <laughs> and uh, you just have to get up and, and get on with it and see what happens and, and grow, you know, learn and uh, stretch. And uh, people would often say uh, to myself, and, and I sent a tutor of the sister I was with, it, oh, you're so courageous, you're very courageous. And it didn't feel at all like that. It didn't feel in the slightest bit courageous. It was just life is asking this, for this to happen, and it has to be done, and, and it's kind of hard work, you know. Um, and then over time, I got to see this, this phenomena of, well, what is it that's so difficult? It's, it's a feeling. And, uh, and, and then the more I looked, I saw, well, what is that feeling? It's, it's, a, it's a projection into the future of something that's going to happen. So I, what I, it took me a while to see it, but there was this projection of, okay, I'm over here now, we've got to start a monastery, and then I'm going to have to do all this teaching, and I'm going to have to you know, have a really good meditation practice together so that you can do it. And there'd be all of this kind of story going on quietly. I mean, probably not very quietly, but it was sort of like... <laughs> <laughs> it was there all the time, and uh, and then there would be this kind of there would be this fear arising of like oh my goodness I can't do it it's all too much I mean it's, this is much too big for me I can't do it no no and then there would be kind of a shutting down falling asleep and uh, that was going on for quite a long time and then and then one day uh, I was I was fortunate enough to be sitting at meditation retreat with a a very uh, um, is it good practitioner, a monk who had very deep practice, and he gave this, uh, this meditation instruction on the contemplation of death, something we don't like to think about too much. And, uh, but it is something that the Buddha really, really encouraged us to contemplate. And he gave this teaching a, a way of, of practicing meditation on the contemplation of death. And he said, as you breathe in, just bring to mind, this could be my last breath. As you breathe out, spring to mind, this could be my last breath. Just that. Very simple. And as he gave that instruction, as I was breathing in, it was really like, this could be my last breath, you know. And, uh, and suddenly, everything became very sharp and clear. And all my problems fell away. Because what's the problem if this is the last breath? <laughs> there are no problems. They're just things we create in our mind about what could happen in the future. And what's scary, what's difficult, or, or, or maybe we have the story of like, oh gosh, it's like this, oh no, it's like this, and it's going to be like this forever. Mm. So we do that with painful things, you know, painful feelings, painful bodily experiences, painful relationships. Oh God, it's like this again, oh no, not again, it's going to be like this forever. And so then we create this miserable <laughs> present <laughs> based on an idea of what things are going to be in the future. So in that uh, practice, it's like, oh. There's no problem. There's no future, no problem. No self, no problem. <laughs> There's just this. And um, for me, being a bit of a sleepy type, tendency to, to be more sleepy than, than anxious generally, uh, the, the in-breath is particularly useful. Um, so, so when you, and if, you're, if you tend towards sort of wanting to shut down, go into oblivion, then using the in-breath is really, really helpful for sharpening up. Because it's like the life-giving breath. It's like this is your last chance, you know. Wake up. 
And then if you have a tendency to anxiety, then that can make you more anxious. So then you, with the out breath, letting go. This could be my last breath. Just let go. Let go of any worries. You know? So um, I found this a very uh, helpful practice in, in cutting the proliferation of the mind that, that creates the, the scenario into which we have to arouse courage in the first place, if you understand what I mean. You know, we, we need the courage to meet the ideas of what we think life is going to be bringing. And then always, you know, here we all are. We've all survived this far. We've all got this far. And um, probably much more than survived. Grown enormously. Developed skills. You know, friendships. Gifts that we can give to others. And uh, so, you know, on one hand it does take courage to keep stepping consciously into life. I think if we, if we remain unconscious, it's, it's kind of easy, but it's not very beneficial. But to stay conscious and keep stepping into life, it does take a certain courage, but then the more finely we are aligned with, with truth, with presence, then even courage becomes kind of irrelevant. It's just this, it's just this, it's just this. And I turned to, uh, earlier on, she spoke about the, the Four Noble Truths, and uh, which is like really at the, the heart of the Buddha's teaching. And the first noble truth, dukkha. So dukkha is sometimes we translate it as suffering. It's, it's much broader than that. It can be from, from out and out suffering to just like a slight dissatisfaction with how things are and, and everything in between that. So uh, you know, the, the teaching is that there is dukkha. It's like we, we, we notice it, there is dukkha. And then Dukkha should be understood. And uh, Ajahn Sumedho, when I lived with Ajahn Sumedho, he would often say, stand under it. Stand under it. You know? It's like, like, let it rain on you. <laughs> Don't be afraid of it. Standing under Dukkha. I find that really, really helpful. It's like, because we, we, we feel what's, what's Dukkha, we feel what's difficult or unpleasant or scary or just a, a little bit painful. And we want to push it away. It's, it's an immediate response. We want to push it away. We want to get away from it. And then we get stuck in that relationship of aversion with what is dukkha. And then, we, and then it doesn't go away. So we, we add dukkha on top of dukkha on top of dukkha. And, uh, and what, could, what starts off as a little a slight um, discomfort ends up being a sharp pain because we're so tense around it, trying to get rid of it, that you know, it's, it gets bigger than it was you know, before we paid attention to it. So uh, this standing under suffering or standing under dukkha, letting it rain on you, letting the, that water go down your back, just relaxing into it, it's, it's powerful. And then what is what starts as a small discomfort disappears. And what starts as a, as a, as a big, huge problem is just a feeling. Or maybe a thought and a feeling right now. That's all it is. And uh, you know, when I, as I say, the more I look at it, the more I see that this this um, relationship to feeling it, is what it's what pushes us around. It pushes us and pulls us around in our life. So any kind of addiction, which so 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 many people have of, of various kinds, it's all about relationship to feeling. It comes down to there's a painful feeling here but I don't want to feel so I'm going to have something that makes me feel better. I'm going to take something in that makes me feel better. Or maybe you know, it's, it's often it's taking something in drink, something to eat, some drugs or something, something visual. Or it might be not. You know, It might be like I, because I don't want to feel painful feeling, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to not eat enough that I don't feel embodied enough that I don't have to feel what's going on in this body. That's another way. It's another kind of addiction. And so uh, it's, it all comes down to feeling. So if we can learn to be with the feeling that is, that is present right here, everything's okay. It's all fine. It's not that, that, it's not that uh, we abdicate ourselves of responsibility, that we don't have to you know, respond to what's wrong in the world and you know, stand up for what is true. And still, we actually have more energy to do that. But we're not, uh, we're not spending our life running away from 
the, the feeling of being embodied, the feeling of being here. I think a lot of our experience is like that, whether, we're, we're, whether it's just like staying in the mind, keeping away from the body, or, you know, uh, overwhelming our, our minds with, with pleasant sensation or avoiding the, uh, you know, ignoring the experience of what it's like to be here in this body and mind. And, uh, you know, the Buddha really points to the whole of the teachings, everything we need to know in order to fully awaken, not just like be a little bit released, but to fully awaken is right here in this body and mind. And, you know, look around the room, there's all, we're all different shapes and sizes and ages and colors and genders and all of that. And each, each of us has the perfect body to awaken within. It's this one, it's the one we've got, you know, it's yours, it's mine. <laughs> it's the perfect one. So, um, so no, we have we need to have the courage to, to, to do many things in life. But I think that the greatest, the most important courage is to turn back towards this experience of, of being here in this body that's like this, that meets the world because of how it looks and how it's you know shaped and how old it is or young it is and all of that. It meets the world in different ways depending on how it looks. Or the world meets it in different ways, and it's like this, and this is and this is perfect. So uh, the courage to turn back and to befriend this this one, and to appreciate this one, and to and to hold it lightly, to know you know this one, it's you know it, it's gonna it's part of nature. It's going to go through the the process of nature that everything goes through. It's, it's born, it's, it grew, it's, it comes into fullness, it, it ages, it gets sick, it, get, it heals again. It's amazing, it's an amazing system. But it can't heal forever, and eventually then it starts to break down, and then when the time comes it will die, this body. And that's perfect, there's nothing wrong with that, it's perfect. And that is part of the teaching, that this, this body that we think of as me and mine, that we you know, try to get pleasant experiences from and try to run away from unpleasant experiences, it's, it's meant to feel both. You cannot, ev you cannot only feel ple pleasure and not feel pain. There's only, it's always both. One follows the other. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's our teacher for this time. And the Buddha says to, to be born in the human realm is the most precious of births. I used to hear that and I used to feel like, it certainly doesn't feel like that. <laughs> I don't know where he's coming from. But over time I've realized, oh, it really is. Because we can experience really beautiful experiences, heavenly, blissful experiences, and we can experience really painful, hellish experiences, and everything in between. And it's like, it's, it's having the being in the middle and be able to have the capacity for all of that and to be able to see it arising and passing away arising and passing away none of it lasts forever but that's the the teaching right there that every pleasant thing that arises here it arises due to certain conditions it's there for a while it brings pleasure like those raspberries I was talking about actually somebody actually gave us raspberries amazingly so <laughs> 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 you know the, the pleasure is there for a while and then it passes. Same with the pain. The pain is there for a while and then it passes. And even even chronic pain, you might feel like, well, if actually I've got chronic pain, it doesn't pass. I've got it all the time. It's chronic. But even chronic pain, if you're really with it, it's constantly changing. It's never. It's not like a fixed experience. If you're, if you're with it, if you move towards it and you lean into it, rather than pushing away from it, it's changing all the time vibrating, it's shifting, it's maybe, maybe it's an ache, it's moving a bit, it's, it's always changing. And, uh, you know, it's, as part of our capacity to develop the, uh, as part of our practice of developing the capacity to be with feeling, uh, another practice that's very helpful is to, to sweep through the body, sweep your attention through the body, 
I just noticed the way I like to do it is just, I first of all, I'll do it from the top of my head down to the soles of my feet. Just noticing what pleasant feeling is present right now. Do it kind of slowly ish. Any pleasant feeling. And, you know, and I might think, oh, well, there isn't any. You know, and then, then I start <laughs> sweeping through, and it's like, oh, no, actually, lips feel quite nice. Oh, it's kind of warm here. It's kind of nice. And, you, know, you start to notice there are actually much more places that feel pleasant than I would have guessed. You know, based on what I, uh, an immediate assumption. And so you realize oh, there's, there's quite a bit of pleasant going on, actually. Not wonderfully pleasant, you know, but pleasant. <laughs> and then you get to the soles of your feet, and, and then moving up, just noticing any painful feeling that might be present. <coughs> and, and not going straight to the painful feeling, but sweeping through the body bit by bit. And then when you get to the painful bit, knowing, oh, yeah, there's the painful knee. Oh, yeah, there's the painful knee, the painful knee. Thighs feel fine. And you keep going, the rest of it feels fine. Oh, there's the painful hip. And then you keep going, and, it's like, and you realize that, well, there are pains, but most of it actually feels okay. Nothing special. And then going down through neutral feeling, neither pleasant or unpleasant, that's something we just ignore. We ignore the neutral feeling, which is the, which is the, the biggest part of our life. <laughs> Most of our life is not neither spectacularly wonderful or spectacularly terrible. It's just kind of neither. And then we just skip over that, looking for something more sensational. So, you know, it's the, uh, the underlying, like, hidden in that is the tendency to ignore. And ignore, obviously, is connected with ignorance, which is the opposite to awakening. So, uh, you know, just sweeping, so sweeping down, looking at the pleasant, up the painful, and then down again, neither pleasant nor unpleasant, which is the majority of the experience. So you're paying attention to what is nothing in particular. It sounds a bit odd, but it's important. And then just seeing how the mind will just go off. It's like it's not entertained, it's not, it's not interesting. But no, what does it feel like? That, what does it feel like, that nothing in particular feeling? That's also really, really important in this path of awakening. And getting to know that and and training the mind to be with that too, all the way down to the soles of the feet. And then on the way back up the fourth time, you just do generally feeling whatever's there, just whatever's there. So uh, that can be a very helpful practice in getting to know and getting familiar and comfortable with feeling as feeling. And then uh, <coughs> just, just recognizing <coughs> Getting to, getting to see the way your, your mind works. So when there's, you know, we, we all have these different tendencies. So some people tend to aversion, some people tend to greed, some people tend to delusion. And we all tend to all of them actually, but some lean more in one direction than another. And, and, um, and just going to know with your own mind, you know, do, are you an aversive, do you have aversive tendency? <laughs> <laughs> delivery. <laughs> so we have a, like an aversive tendency, so it's a tendency just to, to want to push away. So then if you have that strong tendency to want to push away, then no, get to get to really see if you can catch it. See if you can catch that moment where you're just going, and, and just stop for a moment. Take a breath. See, what, what is it like if I just, I'm still going to push it away, but not quite as soon. You know? What is it like just to, just to have the courage to feel the unpleasant feeling. And then maybe we can feel it for a moment or two and then we're like, okay, I need to do something else. But we felt it for a moment or two and that's good. Or maybe we can just stay with it long enough to see it change of its own accord, like every feeling does, everything, everything does. Maybe we can just stay with it, stay with it and then it's, there it is, it's gone. Or, or make the mind large enough that there's Space, you know, it's not it's not just honed in around the painful bit, but there's room for the for the whole picture, and that's just one little thing that's going on in, in a much bigger picture. And uh, with, with, if we have a tendency to greed, I'm more that way inclined myself. If we have a tendency to greed, you know, just seeing the the moving, to, you know, the wanting to lead into things, the wanting to, oh yes, I'll do that. Oh yes, I'd like that. Oh yes, that's nice. Oh, that looks nice. You know. Just seeing that that tendency to, to always, and then what about just stepping back and letting those nice things pass and feeling they're kind of like, oh, <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> so it's just going to know those those feelings and, and the push. Like feeling has it it has like a push behind it. Pleasant feeling's got a push. I want it, I want it, I want it. And then painful feeling has the same push actually. I don't want it, I don't want it, I want to push it away. It's the same. And it's got that kind of push. And then knowing getting to know the push instead of being pushed around. Having the courage to stay present with the push. And then taking a breath. And you know, if you're a greed type like me, leaning back a little bit. Or if you're an aversive type, leaning in a little bit. You know. If you want to ignore, if you tend to space out, coming back. Coming back to the body. And just having the, the courage to feel. I mean, it sounds like nothing much, you know, it sounds like so what a bit, but it's, it's a profound key, actually, in, in the path of awakening. So we, you know, when, we're, when we can just be with what is present here and now, as it is, yeah. we have choice, we have space, we have choice, we have, the, we have more energy also. And, uh, and like I said before, it's not that we then we don't do anything or we, we just become apathetic because we're just being here feeling everything. Yeah. It's not like that. But it's more like we're not pushed around. We can choose what we're doing. We can choose it for the right reasons rather than do it because we can't not do it. And if we want to always avoid painful feeling, then it, it becomes crazy making after a while. Our <laughs> life is always just ducking and diving, trying to trying to find a way of getting around some uh, something that feels like it's going to be too uncomfortable. So just really learning how to t turn towards and and stand under. And then it's true that our, our life does, it, it gets bigger, you know, our, the, the, it does become ever increasing circles, or, you know, the, 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 I remember once thinking of it as like being in a ring of fire, it felt like I was in this ring of fire that was quite small, and I didn't want to still be in it, but I knew if I'm going to grow, I've got to go through that, and it's kind of scary, but I don't want to stay in this little tiny ring forever. So then you kind of muster up the courage and then jump through it. And you're like, oh, and then there's more room. And you feel, what a relief. I'm so glad I did that. And then you realize, oh, and there's another one now. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to kind of go on like that. But it's, you know, the more you do it, the more it's not a problem. The more it's just like, okay, I know this one. Yeah. You still have to muster up a bit of courage, but, you know, you know it's worth it. And just uh, you know, reflecting on the, on the Buddha's path, his his uh, journey of awakening, it was a, a journey of it was a, both of courage and of curiosity. There was like a driving force of wanting to know, wanting to find truth, and a, and, a, and an investigation of like how can I find it? How can I find it? So, uh, first of all, just to have that sense of what is one's, what is your intention? You know, what is your intention in life? What is the overarching intention in your life and in your practice? Because if you don't have the overarching intention, then it, it's, there's less motivation to go through those rings of fire. It's more, there's more of an inclination just to stay in the comfort zone. But if you kind of have an overarching intention, and you know what that is, then you know, inevitably we're going to meet different challenges along the way, and then there'll be the, the confidence and the motivation to, to to move into those to, to kind of to face the, the challenging times and I'm just looking at the Buddhist path. You know, first of all, um, you know, they, they say growing up in a, in a very comfortable environment, the challenges were not too difficult, and then developing these these deep states of concentration. So his first his first um, teachers were jhana practitioners, where he developed these deep states of concentration and uh, became very proficient in those states and, uh, and then realized, well, they, they're profound and they're beautiful, but they're not, they don't lead me to the ending of suffering. And so that, that overarching intention kept him going, if they're going to leave that, that's not giving me the answer I'm looking for. 
and then going into these very extremely austere um, practices, you know, where they say he was like starving himself to death, and he, could, he touched his belly, he could feel his backbone, you know, this kind of thing, where it's like very, very extreme austerities. And people do still practice quite extreme austerities in India, so you can, if you go there, you can get a sense of it isn't that odd, you know, this is what people did. And then uh, recognizing, that, you know, too much, too much concentration isn't it, and too much austerity isn't it. And then this, finding this place of just like letting go, like a relaxation. So it's not sloppy falling asleep relaxation, and it's not pushing, but it's it was just this like letting go, and then finding that place of of peace where the mind isn't striving for something and it isn't pushing anything away and recognizing that's the place that's that's it and, and wanting to find well that's it but how do how does one keep that you know how do you stay there because the the pushing and pulling is is, is always it's always going on isn't it and uh, just thinking about the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree and all of these kind of forces of the hordes of Mara coming to seduce him or to frighten him or to you know, challenge him and, and then just touching the earth. I love that image of the Buddha touching the earth and saying, the earth is my witness. And I always feel like, you know, this body that is our dearest friend, even though we often don't treat it that way, is, is like that, it's touching the earth. So when we come back, whatever's going on in our life, in our hearts, in our minds, Coming back to this body here, this good friend here, and it's like the earth element, and then being grounded here in the body, it's always here. And when there's fear, usually we're up here in the head, and when the heart's racing, we're up here, out of ourselves. And so, like coming back to the feet on the ground, grounded, earth. It's amazing. It's amazing how powerful it is. It can be really, really. Sort of, um, <coughs> caught in, in trembling and anxiety, and then, and then you remember, like, oh, body, ground, you know, sit down on the chair, feel the, feel the holding of this chair, or feel the ground beneath my feet, like, it's holding us, you can rest into it, and then there can be this letting go, like, resting back into, it's like touching the earth, not getting lost in the, the concepts and the thoughts and the stories, but back into what is here and now. This so this body's like an anchor that always keeps us connected to what is happening here and now. So it's very important that we befriend this body, not just use it. And uh, you know if you if you have that overarching intention and uh, and we keep Following that, you know, if, the, if the intention is to really free the heart and to be a benefit to other beings, you know, and we keep following that, then we find ourselves. It's kind of it's a bit of a mysterious journey, you know. You find yourself. <laughs> you might find yourself somewhere where you never think you'd be, doing something you never thought you'd be able to do. And yet you can do it because you know that the motivation is there to awaken and, and the path has taken you to this place. So to really, uh, you know, everything we need is here. You brought it with you, actually. You came to listen to us talking, but you actually brought your best teacher along with you. <laughs> it is your body and mind. It is your body, actually. You brought it along and it's just remembering that it, this is it, it's here. And, and trusting that the wisdom that you need to awaken is right here in your own hearts. Buddha was a man, he was a human being. He was a person. He wasn't a god or a deity. He was a person who lived in India, who walked around and taught people once he saw the truth. And what he pointed to was the truth that he has seen, everyone can see. It is it is, a, you could say, an open secret that he's saying, this is the secret. <laughs> so just trusting that everything you need is right here, you have it, you are it. And it's just 
finding the conditions that remind you again and again. You know, when there was nuns, so we have these robes, very, very helpful. You know, you get up in the morning and you put on the robes. It's like, oh yes, that's what my life is oriented to. And then it starts being with another nun, you know, you look at her and you say, oh yes, it's just, you know, they're oriented towards awakening. Not that we're necessarily awakening any faster than anyone else, but it's a constant reminder that this is what we're here for. This is what life is for. It's for awakening. It's for awakening wisdom and compassion. It doesn't matter what you're wearing or where your work is or anything. It's a, life is for awakening wisdom and compassion and finding ways to live that in your own life and, and in the world. So. You know, I really wish everyone, all of us, the courage to to follow that and to, to do that and to really make best use of this precious human birth.